Exactly, yeah. So I'm Tom Van Dyke, and I work at the Royal Bank of Canada. I run the Environment, Social, and Governance Group there. We run about $1.5 billion, all of it ESG screen. So first I want to ask, how many people here are students, universities, working and looking? Are your universities looking or addressing the idea of carbon risk in their portfolios right now? Is, are you with 350 by chance? Or work, working with 350? Which group, which, which university are you with? UBC, they just divested. UBC, University of British Columbia. Yeah. Congratulations. Good. Greg, Gregory Robertson's a great mayor. Yeah. Um, but Tiny Collins, Warren Wilson. Uh huh. North Carolina. North Carolina? Asheville? Yes. Great. Okay. And, and now, anybody here from a, uh, uh, say, a foundation? No? Okay. Mm -hmm. found it running a foundation of some type? Family foundation, private foundation, family office? Family office, are you, are you considering divestment or you, have you looked at your risk associated with owning fossil fuel companies? I invested in a wind farm. Yeah, I know. I heard, I heard you earlier today. Yeah. yeah. So, so across the other portfolio. So what we want to do first is can I define what the problem is? We'll do that quickly because I think many of you understand what the problem is as far as the carbon budget. What's the risk from the standpoint of owning these companies? Where's the opportunity in the portfolio? These gentlemen are going to talk about from a clean tech perspective as well as from an index perspective. So just quickly, there's approximately 2,800 gigatons of carbon dioxide identified as proven reserves already on the fossil fuel company's balance sheets today. They can only burn about a third of that. Before we raise the temperature of the planet to the two degrees Celsius level, that all nations in Copenhagen in 2009 agreed that we cannot raise the temperature of the planet above. Okay. So you have to ask yourself if you're an investor or fiduciary owning stocks in these companies, why are they spending a lot of money, but basically $700 billion in capital expenditures, most of it looking for new reserves, if they can only burn a third of what's already on their balance sheets? How long is it going to take to get to that point? Well, if you listen to Jim Hansen, he thinks he's the head of NASA, former head of NASA climatologist, he thinks it's somewhere in the 12 year range will get a good idea. Of course, the climate deniers don't think it's happening, right? But Price Waterhouse, who's not really known for making outlandish comments, says it's going to be 20 years till we get there. So this idea of a 100-year plan until we get there, 20 years till we get to 2 degrees Celsius is how long it's going to take. <coughs> so we as investors and fiduciary standpoint need to be asking the oil companies, okay, what's going on? You know, shouldn't you be taking this money that you're spending in capital expenditures and returning it to us in the form of dividends or buying your stock backs or diversifying into other parts of the, your, your business to, to protect the shareholder value that exists there. And there's costs. Many of you probably saw today that Ohio froze the renewable portfolio standard in the front page of the New York Times Business Section. <coughs> and there are costs actually associated with today, with inaction. In 2012, we spent, just in the United States alone, spent $139 billion dealing with climate disasters. That's droughts, floods hurricanes, tornadoes, or fires. The great risk arbitrators of our of the capitalistic system only picked up the tab on $33 billion of it. Uninsured investors picked up 10. And look around the room, because you know who picked up the tab on the rest? You and I, the U.S. taxpayer. So these are externalities that Carter's talking about, flying off the balance sheets of the fossil fuel companies in the form of carbon pollution. It's not effectively priced. And they're sucking up our excess capital. Tax capital. That's more money than we spent on transportation and education in the United States in 2012. Second only to defense. If you extrapolate out some of Bloomberg's data, within 10 years we could be spending over $200 billion a year, a year, on dealing with climate disasters. That's essentially what we're spending at the Defense Department on Clinton. So this is our taxpayer excess capital being sucked up <coughs> by the fossil fuel companies and being made by their shareholders. How big is this bubble? Well, the bubble can be pretty big. The NASDAQ bubble.com was about $5 trillion. From, this is from peak to bottom. Housing bubble, 07, 09, $7 trillion. The carbon bubble is projected to be around $20 trillion. So from a scale of problem, if you're a fiduciary and you're an owner of these companies, you need to be asking them questions as what is this management team doing? Why are you looking for more reserves when you can't really burn it? You're just creating a bubble. If you're an investor, you're taking that kind of risk. Let's talk about these capital expenditures and see if they're actually earning 
the kind of revenue increases that you need to. Exxon, this, this oil is becoming harder and harder to get and more and more expensive to find. When you're drilling in the Arctic, when you're drilling these big shells, 51% increase in capital expenditures, but you're not seeing an increase in revenue. That's another concern as an investor. Chevron, 89% negative 3% in revenue. You're not getting the bang for the buck from the standpoint of allocating capital, looking for new reserves. What's happening on the other side? And this is where the fossil fuel comes become in incredibly difficult situations. They say that, they say that wind and solar are, are subsidized. The number card that you're looking for is $1.9 trillion is the amount of money we spend globally, annually, subsidizing the most profitable industry that we've known of. $1.9 trillion a year going towards fossil fuel companies. If you want to end the subsidy, end the depletion allowance in the United States. Get rid of it. Let's even the playing field between the renewable energy guys and the fossil fuel guys. They're the biggest people at the trough when it comes to subsidies. What's happening though, instead, when oil prices go up, what happens on the renewable energy side? PV modules have dropped from 350 a watt in 08 to 70 cents a watt. Kilowatt hours, <coughs> 21 cents a kilowatt in 2010, 10 cents today, 6 cents in three years. It's a grid parity in 18 states today. It'll be a grid parity in the entire country at six cents a kilowatt hour in three years. Same thing's true. You got wind power, and cards going to go into some of this. The dropping, these represent the dropping cost of the bar charts, and the line is the acceleration adoption as those costs are dropping, as you'd expect. So when oil gets more expensive, what happens to renewable energy? It becomes even more attractive, and it gets cheaper as more adoption takes place. So you got wind, solar, LED lighting. Same practice. And then, and then the holy grail of it all, batteries. Once you get to battery storage, you can evenize the frequency of the grid. Larry Fink said, this is the holy grail. This is the game changer. <coughs> Larry Fink runs BlackRock. They're the largest asset manager in the world, $4 trillion. He believes that this could happen within the next decade. He said that at a conference I was at. If that happens in the next decade, these liquid natural gas plants, you need 20 or 30 years to get your money out of if you're an investor, you're not going to be able to get that money out. He said, when I asked him, I said, so we're going to ship through those natural gas pipelines in 10 years. He goes, we're going to have to figure out something else. I said, well, you could start with water coming from Canada, going to, to, to potentially Texas and California. Speaking of California, California is right now 33% renewable, renewable energy requirements by 2020. We think we can do 50% by 2030. We are the late, eighth largest economy in the world. So Ohio may decide to freeze, and we can get the rest of these numbers. Ohio may decide to freeze theirs. But California is going to continue to innovate. And as a result, we will have the technology's nerve centers located in California, and we will export those solutions economically and will continue to grow. By the way, our power, because our utilities are decoupled, which means that we, our utilities can make money by encouraging you to buy more efficient appliances as opposed to building another power plant, which is the main profit model right now for utilities in the United States. They build a power plant, they add a margin to that. We actually encourage our utilities in the city to do that, to encourage you to buy more efficient appliances. Our power has only gone up 11% per capita since 1978, and our economy has certainly grown. This is, this is a quick graph on, well, what's done since 2012? Coal is the black line, nat gas is the red line, and the green and blue lines are wind and solar. So from a return perspective, it's been better. Now let's look at how much does it cost to get this out of your portfolios if you want to divest from fossil fuels, because one of the movements is to divest from the fossil fuels, to divest from the risk. This is the all-world index. This is carbon-free. This goes further than what 350.org wants to do with the top 200 companies. It goes back to 1997, and, and then there's countless studies like this. I'm not going to bore you with all of them, but there, this is one main one that's been out there. Basically, the risk, the return is about the same, 6.8 versus 6.5. Little more risk, two one hundredths of a point, de minimis. Tracking error, roughly, you know, in, in line, and you have like sharp ratio means your risk adjusted return is better. The point is you can pull out of these companies and not affect your return in a negative way. In fact, when we did South African divestment, we asked the major pension funds to divest from South Africa. We said you need to sell 40% of the S&P 500 to get out. Energy companies make up about 10% of most indexes, plus or minus a point. <clears throat> the Carbon Tracker 200, which is the 200 largest companies that produce carbon, 
represent about 7.8% of the total benchmark, or 78% of that 10%. When you look at most pension funds' portfolios, it ends up to be 3 or 4% is the total position in these companies. That is not a heavy lift compared to the South African apartheid divestment movement that we had. You're talking about 3 or 4%. That's not going to diminish, that's not going to affect return very much. Here's the various, car here's, here's what Stanford did. Stanford is, many people know, $18 billion divested from active management coal companies. Tracking error, 1.4. Let's discuss tracking error for a moment. 0.5 or less, you're the index from an investment consulting perspective. 1.5 to 0.5, you're an enhanced index. Anything over 2 is considered active management. Okay, here's your tracking error. This is the Carbon Tracker 200, 0.6. You're essentially still the index for removing the Carbon Tracker 200. If you get rid of the worst of the sectors, Halliburton, Monsanto, Walmart, as an example, and then put a sustainability tilt on the benchmark, it's still 0.9 if you want to track, keep the tracking error below 1. So you can actually design these benchmarks in ways that allow you to say, if I think sustainability would create alpha, you can scale that up and still keep the tracking error relatively reasonable. How big is the solar wind in clean tech or low carbon economy, broadly defined? Cars can talk more about this. It's not just wind and solar. It's the entire infrastructure of the economy. It's the buildings, lighting, insulation, HVAC, waste energy, recycling, 500 billion, 50 billion in waste energy, pa packaging, agriculture, 1.3 trillion. They're talking about that right now. It's a huge market that's <coughs> out there that exists in organic and food waste reduction. It's water, 500 billion dollars in water. Talk about two things that aren't priced. Carbon and water are not priced effectively in our system. Capitalism doesn't do that. It needs to be priced. The most effective way to price carbon is to put a tax on it. When you tax it, the carbon markets have failed. They, they're not working. California's the one that's only up and up. Well, there's one operating in Europe, but it's, it's like three or four bucks. California's market is about 11.75 right now. You do not get any significant innovation in, in clean technology or in technology unless the price of carbon is about 50 bucks a ton, plus or minus 10. Mercer did a study, and they said, if we do business as usual for the next decade, don't do a thing differently. We will need to price carbon at $225 a ton just to correct the problems that are underway. $225 a ton. You can ask Shell to model that and see what they have to say. Ask Exxon what they have to say. We're doing that as shareholders. That's the most effective way to price carbon. Tax it. $25 a ton. Increase it $10 a ton for the next 20 years so business can allocate capital accordingly. What business doesn't like is uncertainty. And the stop and going at the credits, the stop and going at the RPS is, is not effective. You'd say, okay, for the next 20 years, 25 bucks a ton, increase 10 bucks a ton. They can say, that's great. We can model that and we can allocate capital accordingly over the next 20 years. That's what business needs. They need stability of where the pricing structure is going to be. Energy, energy storage grid, 80% of the infrastructure between now and 2050 has yet to be built in the world. Think about that. So think about the opportunities that we can have from the ideas of efficiencies and building that out. Transportation clearly needs to move from a petrochemical molecule to an electron, and you're seeing that begin to start. You know, you could say that Tesla might be a battery storage company. So here's some of the here's some of the companies, the efficiencies that are taking place, climate change, businesses, it's across the supply chain, 51% of companies, core businesses are affected by natural resource shortages. So everyone's gonna have to be dealing with this, and shareholders need to be engaging companies along the area of climate risk. And then the last thing I close with is what Desmond Tutu said, who joined this movement two weeks ago. He said, serving as, and this is where the religious play a role, serving as stewards of creation is not an empty title. It requires us to act with all the urgency of this dire situation demands. And he said, we need to divest as a result of that. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Lunch.